Okay, so um, we're going to look at the more examples for 1.2, um, and so we'll see how they go. Paper view. Okay. So here they're asking me to find the equation of this parabola, and they have given me three points on the parabola, and um, and so I'll be able to find the equation of the parabola given those three points. It would be easier, um, and I could do it a different way, if they gave me the vertex than what I'm going to do right now. And or, and or if they gave me the x-intercepts, that would be lovely. Uh, they did give me the y-intercept, and that is going to make it slightly easier because I have the y-intercept, but it's not going to, um, it, it's not going to, it helps a little bit. It doesn't help a lot, I guess, is what I'm going to. It helps a lot. It, it's, it's, it's nice. Um, and so the points that would be, make it really nice to have, though, is if I had either the vertex or if I had the intercepts right there. But they didn't give me those. So here's the idea is that this thing, because they, they said it was quadratic, too, uh, and so I, I guess the way looking at it, I could suspect that it's quadratic, but I might also sp suspect that it has raised to the fourth, uh, could be as well. And so this is what quadratic equations, quadratic functions look like. Y equals AX squared plus BX plus C. This is in standard form. I know because it's upside down that A is negative. That's not a huge hint, but I, I do know that. This one Right here, this point though, where x is um, 0 and y is 1, and that was the y-intercept, is a nice point to pit, put in first. Because when I put in x is 0 and y is 1, I get y 1 equals um, a times 0 squared plus b times 0 plus c. And what I needed to find was a, b, and c. And these points, these three points, are going to help me find A, B, and C. And do you notice that because that was such a nice point that I have just found, um, I have just found C. C is equal to 1. So that's why I was saying that the y-intercept is nice um, because what I need to find is A, B, and C, and the, the y-intercept actually gave me C. And so um, now I'm going to work on um, trying to find A and B. And so this point right here, x is negative 2 and y is 2. So I'm going to put that in this equation right here. So when I do, so here's y, right? y equals ax squared plus bx. I have room. I have plenty of room. So I'm going to write that so you make sure that you understand. I'm plugging in y is 2, and I'm plugging in x. is negative 2. And you notice that I used parentheses when I plugged in. I forgot to say it over here. And I'm getting, oh, I got to use parentheses here. The reason I'm getting, oh, I got to use parentheses here is because negative 2 squared is different, right, is a different value. Negative 2 squared with parentheses is not equal to negative 2 squared. And so are there parentheses or are there not parentheses? When you substitute parentheses are implied. So yeah, there are parentheses. I am substituting. So this equation, using this point, um, this point right here, right, is equal to negative 2 squared. That's 4a. So this is 2 equals 4a minus 2b. And I don't know if y'all remember, but c was 1. So plus 1. So this equation, remember I wanted to find a and b, when I take away 1 both sides, becomes 1 equals 4a, because um, I'm taking away 1 both sides, so 2 take away 1 is 1, 4a minus 2b. And I'm like, oh, that just didn't tell me a or b, but it gave me an equation. And I'm going to do that again, right, with this other point down here, that point right there. And so uh, using my same little equation, y equals ax squared plus bx plus c, uh, y is equal to negative 
and a is uh, x is equal to 1. And so right here, b times 1 plus c. So I have negative 2.5 equals 1a, so a plus b, and then remember that c was equal to 1. And yeah, you might have already put in your c was equal to 1, but it's, you know, that's all style. And so I'm going to take away 1 both sides. So I get this equation, minus 3.5 equals a plus b. And then I want to put these two equations together, two equations, two unknowns, so that I can find a and I can find b. Uh, because they're lined up, you can easily use elimination. If you wanted to use substitution method, you can solve that equation for a or for b and then plug into the other equation. I am going to go ahead and use the um, elimination method because it's my favorite method. And so in order to use the elimination method, um, you have to choose a variable to eliminate, and I'm going to choose to eliminate B. Um, but if you're asking, could you have chosen to eliminate A? And the answer is yes, half dozen each to the other. You choose whichever one you want. The reason I chose B and not A is because I have negative B here, negative 2B, and I have B here, positive. And what you want to do is you want to make them opposite of one another. So I'm actually going to have to multiply this equation by 2. And so that's going to become a reorder on this equation. So I'm going to multiply by 2. Uh, and that's going to make negative 7, because negative 3.5 times 2, equals 2A plus 2B. And then what you do is you stack them on top of one another. And I know I've written, I, I'm tired, so and I have, so I have not done, I have not solved this efficiently by stacking them as I multiplied and all of that. And um, and so forgive me, um, but just so that you, I'm just showing you every step that I'm doing, right? So and then you add them together. And so when I add them together, I get six a here. Uh, that's our class, right? Math six a. And then uh, the, the B's drop out, and remember that was my goal, was to eliminate B, right? I'm using the elimination method. On the other side, I have over there negative 6. And so when I solve for A, dividing by 6 gives me, dividing by 6 gives me that negative 1 equals A. And now I know what C is. I know what C is, 1, and I know what A is, negative 1. I can find B just by going back to any equation in it that has, any equation that I have that has um, A and C in it and B in it. And so like I can use this equation because I know what A is and then once I plug in what A is, I'll be able to find B. I can use this equation because I know what A is and once I put, plug in what A is, I can find B. I can use this equation because I know what A is, then I'll be able to find B. Um, up here on that one, I'm not going to be able to use because that equation, here it became this, right, didn't have B in it. So I need an equation that has B in it um, because I want to find B. So arbitrarily, arbitrarily, I'm going to use this one. You get to pick. And so it just looks like the easiest because it doesn't have a coefficient. I want to solve for B. It doesn't have a coefficient on B. So I think that will be a little bit less work. So this is minus 3.5 equals A, right, plus B. But A is equal to negative 1. And so we get adding 1 to both sides, negative 2.5 equals B. And this is not quite done, but they were asking us to find the quadratic equation, right? And the quadratic equation looked like this. y equals ax squared plus bx plus c. And we knew that a was negative 1. I told you that a would be negative. And, and see how I'm right. y equals negative 1 times x squared uh, plus b. And b was negative 2.5. And c was 1 plus 1. And uh, I don't have to write negative 1 times x squared like that. I can write negative x squared. Um, but you do you on that. That's fine. And I'm sure that this is what they have, though, in the back of the book for the quadratic function. And in fact, 
because they called it a quadratic function, instead of saying y, I bet you they wrote f at x. And that style, to me, I think that we're, um, we would both be right if we if one of us put that and the other put that. And so, um, because to me that would be um, kind of the, the same, same deal. And so, okay, so that was number 12 and we did a lovely job on it. And, oh man, I showed every step. I was, I was awesome. Okay, 1.2 more examples. This is problem 19. And it says the manager of a furniture factory finds that it costs $2,200 to manufacture 100 chairs in one day and $4,800 to produce 300 chairs in one day. Express the cost as a function of the number of chairs produced, assuming that it's linear, then sketch the graph. Um, okay, so we want express the cost as a function a function of the number of chairs produced. Okay, so what we're wanting as our, like our X is the number of chairs. And as our Y is the cost. And so I'm kind of just writing my ordered pair. This is kind of my X and this is gonna be my Y is what it's going to be. Um, and so I just kind of carefully make sure that I got the going which one. So let's see here. They told me that 100 chairs went with $2,200 and 300 chairs went with $4,800. And this is going to be my X1, Y1, X2, Y2. And what I want to do in order to find that, find the linear function is I want to find the slope uh, between those two points. And so remember that the slope is y2 minus y1 divided by x2 minus x1, right? And so this is parentheses when you replace. Yeah, you can get away without using parentheses here because nothing's squared. Uh, but if something's squared, then you wouldn't get away with it. And so uh, this is 4,800 minus 2,200 and 300, I'm really hungry, minus 100. All I think about is um, I'm tired, I'm hungry. It's the beginning of school. Hi, Susie. Are you gonna go under the camera so that they can see you or are you just gonna continue hiding? And she's jumping on my lap and she's saying, hey, and Susie's a little cat is what she is. And um, during COVID, she'd love to get up here and, uh, and teach class. So 2,600, she was very good at it too. Um, people would show me their pets. It was so fun. I love that. That's the only part I liked about COVID. Uh, people also took me on garden tours. Uh, I loved it. That that's, was kind of fun and introduced me to their Family, okay, so 2,600 divided by 200 is 13. Okay, so that's the slope, and I'm supposed to come up uh, cost as a function of the number, so I'm, I've got the slope, and, um, and then you can use, neither one of these is the y-intercept. So you can use point slope if you wanted, which is to find the equation of the, of the line. y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. I wish I wouldn't have written so big there, but I did. And, um, and you can use this x1, y1 that you've already labeled, which would be good. So this would be y minus 2200 equals the slope, which is 13 times x minus 100. And I'm going to just solve for y. So I'm going to distribute the 13 and then add 2200. And I know I'm out of room, but I'm going to do it anyway. Minus 2200. So this is going to be 13x minus 1300. And then I'm going to add 2200. So 
So I get y equals 13x, um, negative 1300 plus 2200 plus 900. And I kind of told you that I was going to let x be the number of chairs and y be the cost. If you, and they said it was a function, so you could write it in a function notation. If you wanted to um, uh, change that into, um, instead of using y, use c, c for cost, then I wouldn't want to use um, c for chairs. Uh, but you could use n for the number of chairs if you liked. And then you could write this as a cost function. And so instead of saying y, you could say c at x equals 13x plus 900, if you liked. I wonder what they did in the back of the book. This is number 19, and I actually have the solution guide up on my computer here. Let's see here. Um, they, they didn't, they left it here at y. They didn't call it, uh, they didn't write it, they didn't even write it in function notation. And so either is good, both of them is good. And so, uh, but if you wanted to, you could do that. Then they asked me, what is the slope um, of the graph and what does it represent? Well, I found the slope before, right? Here was the slope. The slope was 13. Um, sometimes it helps me to put um, units on things and then maybe it'll help me figure out kind of what it's representing. So if I come back here where I found the slope, the 4,800, that was in dollars, right? The tw and so when I subtract this, 4,800 was in dollars and that was in dollars. And so just looking at the numerator here, um, I know I reduced this, but I'm gonna put this here and I'm gonna look at the numerator, that's dollars. $13, and what do I have going in the denominator? Well, it's the number of chairs. And I know that we reduced it, it was 200 chairs is what it is, and now it's one chair, but this is chairs, right? And so the slope is $13 per chair. Per is the division that you have. So $13 per chair. So it asked me, what is the slope? The slope was 13 and it's representing $13 uh, per chair. I wrote my dollar sign there. And, um, and so what is the slope representing? Uh, and what is it telling me? It's telling me that each chair uh, to produce a chair, an additional chair, is going to cost me uh, $13. So the cost to produce, make, or whatever, another chair is $13. What is the y-intercept and what does it represent? Well, the y-intercept, when you put it in y-intercept uh, form here, is 900. That's when x is 0. So the y-intercept, how do you find the y-intercept? You let x equal 0, right? And when you let x equal 0, then you get 900 right there. And so the y-intercept is 900. So they want us to know uh, what does that represent. Well, now remember that x was the number of chairs. And so um, uh, if, I, if we, if they, <laughs> if we produce um, x equals 0 chairs, The cost is $900. And you might be thinking, well, why does it cost $900 to make no chairs? And so there's other things besides the wood in making the chairs, if the chairs are made out of wood, um, there's the cost of renting the building. And so, um, and so this is just your fixed cost, the, fixed, uh, the cost of labor. So if you had people, uh, if you had people coming in, um, uh, let's say that we were paying employees to come in. So I don't know what all of their fixed costs are. 
Uh, but these are, um, it could be the cost to rent the building. It could be the cost of, um, uh, because you have to rent, if, if you were, had planned to work that day, but you didn't end up working that day, um, then you might still have to pay for the building. You probably wouldn't have to pay for any electricity other than the lights on, but if you were using electricity, you know, additional electricity was used, then that wouldn't be probably part of this $900, uh, but maybe you had to pay employees. But some fixed cost that no matter if I make chairs or not, that I have to pay if I'm just to be in business. Okay, and um, and so that's kind of the uh, the story. And then each chair cost thirteen dollars. So um, so just to be in business, uh, it cost me nine hundred dollars. And then each chair I make each day cost me thirteen dollars. And so um, uh, and maybe they they put the ingredients to make the chair, the wood, whatever have you, into that thirteen dollars. Maybe they even figure in electricity that's used in making the um, the um, the chair and all of those kind of that wouldn't be used so having we have the lights on whether we're making chairs or not but we don't use our drill um, and our electric drill if we're not making chairs I don't know anyway something along those lines they didn't they weren't specific uh, but that's what they said um, so that's kind of the story there um, and so this is usually called, I think they call it in economics, fixed costs, but you guys take the economics and you tell me um, if that's what it is. So that's what the $900 is, the fixed cost. Okay, friends, um, that's the story there, and we are uh, done with these examples. I'm so tired that I don't know how to quit the video. I'm just like, oh, I'll just keep, I'll just keep having the video go on and on and on and on.